So welcome. Uh, this is uh, day three, session nine. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, I just want to thank my colleagues, uh, Anko Pate and uh, Marilla for supporting from SEDI. Uh, I'm Bala Pillay. I'm affiliated with uh, SEDI and Sia Kumalela as a coach. Uh, I'm a former DVC of teaching and learning and the Dean of teaching and learning at UKZN and currently Emeritus Professor. Uh, I must say that there's a lot of positive energy in these sessions uh, so far, day three, and it's really looking very good. Uh, so as you've heard, uh, there is a, a swap in the presentations. The first presentation will now swap with the last presentation that is 1010. Uh, an emerging story of student success coaching at Nelson Mandela University will be the last presentation. The first one will become Processing Change, our transition from traditional to virtual orientation at Nelson Mandela University. Okay, so thank you, Mirella. Uh, we're going to start uh, and just ask uh, colleagues, please, uh, if you could allow at least five minutes for questions. Uh, I will I will prompt you uh, before before the time, and so we're starting off with uh, Duncan, Estrace, processing change or transition from traditional to virtual orientation at NMU. Over to you. Thanks, thanks. Um, I'm just going to share a video um, before I start my presentation. I just hope I have the sound on. Can everyone hear? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Going from high school to university is quite a big step. And that is why Nelson Mandela University has provided you with the first year success program. The first year success program is basically the academic orientation program at NMU. And orientation leaders like myself are FYS buddies. The main purpose of orientation is to integrate new students successfully into the academic and social culture of the varsity. The program is an ongoing process aimed at developing and promoting the well-being of new students in all aspects of their lives, whether it be academic, physical, intellectual, spiritual, social, or emotional. We as buddies try to create a climate that is welcoming and assist students in adjusting to the institution whilst minimizing the anxiety and promoting positive relationships between the faculty and students, as well as among students themselves. We provide all sorts of student support services and resources, giving students the necessary skills needed to achieve academic success in a diverse community that respects and accepts all. Despite the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, I was able to use the pre-uni FYS project to help students register, secure funding, find accommodation, and get acclimatized to the new environments as well as online learning. But I didn't stop there. I still and will continue to assist my students with any grievances they may have, whether they may be academic, social, or queries in general. Without the FYS program, I think most first-year students would have been lost, not knowing where to go, who to contact, or how to adjust to the ever-intimidating environment that is possible. Thanks for that. I will stop sharing and then I'll just go to the presentation. I can find my presentation. <laughs> Are you okay, Duncan? Yeah, I just need to, it's been a long time since I've been where. Okay. <laughs> We'll bear with you. Okay. Do you all have the presentation up? Yes, great. Okay. Do you want Thanks. to put it in presentation mode? Great. Yeah. Perfect. So as the um, title indicates, it's, cha it's processing change, our transition from traditional uh, to virtual orientation at Nelson Mandela University. And this is a, a reflective practitioner paper. So it focuses on the aim is the transition of our first year success orientation program at Nelson Mandela University from a fully face-to-face -face orient program to an online offering um, during the pandemic um, 
it will reflect then on by on qualitative feedback between 2020 and, and 2022 from first years, the FYS buddies and staff. Um, the qualitative themes that have emerged from our online student and staff feedback uh, discussions uh, with the various stakeholders. And it will also cover recommendations and areas to reflect uh, for future strengths and uh, the operating model. So just to give a, an, a, a, a feed, but some background on the methodology, we use a 360 approach where we look at staff feedback, peer feedback, and first year feedback. And these are the numbers that you'll see. So if you can see my cursor, these are the feedback uh, that we receive from the from this uh, FYS buddies, the feedback from the staff and feedback from our first years. The, the numbers below are the appointed buddies we had during the year 2020, 2021 and 2022. Um, the same is the number of participants first year that attended orientation. So it will reflect at the in the stable year. So in total, over the past three years, um, we have collected 4,858 um, uh, responses from all stakeholders, both staff and our students and our FYS buddies. So it was anonymous. Um, and we had consisted of both qualitative and quantitative data. And our main focus was on the open-ended questions to establish themes for our program ev evaluation and feedback for both the students and staff. This was to assist us on how we can move over and what, what structures we can put in place for our uh, online orientation. So looking at FYS at Nelson Mandela University. It consists of five pillars, which is our pre uniconnect our VC welcome, our faculty dean welcome, our faculty academic and social welcome, and our faculty orientation thrive. This is for our FYS buddies and our support units, um, offering our social support, um, academic uh, support, both from um, our uh, teaching and learning collab, also from our various directorates. So this forms part of our orientation thrive. Looking at the feedback from our, our, our representative statements, which is verbatim, um, there were far, four themes that came up here. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the concerns was the calendar placement of orienta orientation. So where do we put, where do we, where do we, especially during the COVID period, the shifting dates, that was a concern and students not being registered based on this first based on admissions. Faculty involvement, these were the communication. So as we went through this change, we, we needed to have more sessions, more meetings, hence our, our, our interaction with our faculties and directors were, were, were more rigorous during this period. And one of the issues pre-COVID that we always had was venues. So we always had issues with venue constraints. Now, when we look at the, the online offering, so as you'll see, um, it will go from negative to a positive flow where in our first year moving over to virtual, even from our staff, uh, both academic and past staff, it was an adjustment for them there. Um, and catering um, and being able to, to learn on the spot. But as we went through, we actually started um, familiarizing and, and we, we, we ad adopted the online orientation. And you can see the, especially the, the, the benefit where it offers um, orientation to students while they're still waiting for the NASFAS issues. Based on our peer leader feedback, um, 
we had value add, we, 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 we picked up group size and social awareness. So with regards to the value add, so um, how they value the service that they offer to those students. So here we can see, I've highlighted quite a, a few, um, but you can see there is good experience that they give there. So there's quite a positive self-efficacy that they, they, they give, they have there. Group size is an issue both pre-COVID and post-COVID, um, during the COVID pandemic. Um, and that is one of the, the issues that we are looking at and to resolve. But what, is, what happened with the COVID period is with registration and with finalization of metric results, um, we, we ended having bigger groups because we students were still waiting for some of their outcomes. So that also influenced the group sizes. Social awareness with the training that we offered, the GBV. So having, uh, being aware of themselves at the end of the day, and also uh, what they feel or what they've picked up is the social issues or the social ills that not only they have, but also the first years have. And this is also the year of the WhatsApp. So we're in pre-COVID, it was face-to-face -face and minimal WhatsApp uh, interactions. And they had online, they had Wi-Fi on campus with orientation. Now there is the 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 move or the 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 platform exploded. So looking at indigent and social economic factors, pre-COVID, um, we dealt with, with, with um, issues such as hunger, hunger. Some of the buddies, they came and they, have, they receive a stipend, but this is usually after training. So a lot of them didn't have funding or money for, for the basic needs. Um, but as you can see, as we move into the, the COVID era or period, um, there's also the socioeconomic factors now. So it's, they have personal connection problems at home. So it's also technology. And so that is one of the issues that we've picked up with our buddies. Um, looking at the online offering, so again, there was data issues. How do we deal with that? Um, how, do we, how do we manage or how do we do training? Um, so a lot of the students weren't familiar with teams or experiencing that. And we had to really look our offering. And by giving training on Moodle, um, we could actually advantage them at the end of the day with the material and having it where they could do it on in their own time during their sessions. So they were well prepared. So this assisted with our 2022 orientation based on the feedback that we received in the previous years. Looking at the first year feedback. So um, one of the themes we've picked up or looked at uh, was duration and online and, and the online offering. Pre-COVID, it was too short or it was too long. Um, during 2021, there, it was extremely short and we, we, we were trying to find our feet. So yeah, again, the year of the WhatsApp group, the WhatsApp group became the, 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 the main point where students interacted with their buddies. Um, and as you can see, the, when we entered 2022, when we had a full online, orientation with a hybrid um, and a hybrid, the hybrid uh, component. We, we can see the positive feedback that some of the students weren't physically yeah, but they, they, could, they, could turn, they could do the transition into university life. Um, the Telegram channel. So this was the year that we introduced Telegram to our students. So they could, attend and a lot of updates was done during these telegram sessions. So a lot of positive feedback because of the training. Um, they, one buddy indicated they received the virtual tour from their buddy. 
um, as I could not make it to on a physical tour, it helped me uh, tremendously. So uh, there is, again, it's that hybrid approach that we have there. Looking at technology um, that we have there. Um, so access uh, that some of the students have was they didn't have, because they had to move and to move quickly uh, out of campus, a lot of them didn't have the, the, the software needed to continue with their study. So that was one of the biggest issues that we dealt with. Moodle was one of the other issues that we needed to, to attend to. Um, we've picked up a lot of them. First, just doesn't even know how an email worked. So you can go, you'll see through in, in this presentation all the areas that we've focused on. And what we've done is we've introduced the DG Ready Buddy, uh, which was to assist our buddies, uh, sorry, to assist not just the buddies, but our first years with, uh, with technical support. So we, in 2022, we established a DigiReady help desk where students centered, where students would assist students with technical ICT um, uh, assistance. However, also one, two, two other areas that we looked at is the content. So pre-COVID, pre um, it was dragged, it was, uh, so they indicated it was extremely long. Um, when we look into moving and how we structured our orientation uh, on our platform, there was a lot of positives because now students could attend the VC's welcome um, virtually, where previously uh, they couldn't attend due to, due to finance. Um, we also had our support unit workshops before they even started their lectures, and that is, in, they indicated that the information was so positive for them at the end of the day. Um, and at least now they know their campus better. So for the look and feel, one of the socioeconomic and indigenous factors, again, was they couldn't meet the lectures pre-COVID due to finance because they had before, um, before relocating to Tabeja, um, they had to have funding or money to come in for orientation. So you would skip orientation to attend your classes. So uh, again, some of them didn't enjoy so much orientation face-to-face uh, -face pre pre-COVID because also funding. Now you will see that there is a, with COVID, it moves into the socioeconomic factors. So there's family, that's an issue that hindered their orientation, lack of data, infrastructure. So um, also we, we need to look at the missing middle. So the information for what does the missing middle do um, with regards to bursaries, for as they do not qualify for NAS, for NISPAS. Um, so what our recommendations or in this, our recommendation our, from the FYS team is to have meaningful discussions um, with our support department based on the feedback, annual feedback of our first years and our peer leaders and have that synergy with the directorates. Also collaborating with the various stakeholders to discuss with faculties and support units uh, and viewing their plans and reviewing their plans based on feedback. Um, also review the start of our academic year or the academic year taking into consideration factors such as student financial aid, admissions based on the release of our annual metric results, which also has an effect at the end of the day on orientation because where do you place orientation where a student is more focused or more worried on their fine finances, on their accommodation and their admission status. With that, we looked at the orientation hybrid approach. So with Sia Pumalela and the assistance of Sia Pumalela and based on the data we received, um, we have developed a, a online hybrid uh, orientation. Also, we're expanding on our 
three unit connect because of that pre-exposure that the students have before they even come to the institution. Um, we're looking okay, at the uh, four minutes to close. Yeah, we're looking at a staggered approach to orientation um, carried out in gradual stages. That is phase two and phase three is developing a late orientation. Secondly is annual review, of our training, our content. So annual review of content and training, our methodologies on how we're gonna, uh, how we review our training platforms. So we, as, as you know, it constantly changes and we need to look and see what is available for students out there um, with regards to um, data light and accessible uh, platforms and also the expansion of our DigiReady program um, going forward. So as I've indicated, so these are a few of the stats um, based on some of, our, on, of the feedback. So it's, as, as I've indicated, our training sessions, um, how they find their online training sessions, it, it's quite positive feedback there. The buddies, how they found their Moodle training. Again, you can see there, there's quite a positive feedback we receive from, from, from our buddies there. Looking at continuation of our DG Ready initiative and establishing a man DG DG Ready support, it has grown. So the relevance and the helpfulness uh, it had to the orientation, and these are the feedback from our first years, and also they are more comfortable with the with the university's digital platforms um, because of the pre-exposure. So that's all from my side. Any questions? Thank you, very, thank you very much, Duncan. Thank you for sticking to the time. Uh, we will now take questions or comments. Uh, Marilla, would you point out if any on the chat? There are no questions on the chat at this point. Um, if anybody like to ask a question in person, it'd be nice to. Okay, I'll some... kick off uh, while people are reflecting. Um, Duncan, thank you for that. I think it's quite important to see how this transition has taken place. Can I ask uh, something very quickly? Uh, I saw the staff response. Uh, I, I would say it's somewhat low. Uh, in total, and and secondly, does it qualify or segregate the staff into academic, uh, non uh, non academic support, etc.? Yeah, it's it's voluntary, hence the response is low. And as you see, as the year progresses, it in increased. Um, it's comprised of both past staff members um, and academic. And it's also past staff members within the directorates um, of other units as well, and not only in the academic units. Okay. Uh, and while we're waiting for comments, uh, how long is the orientation program? Uh, I'm not sure if I missed that. Uh, how long? How long does it last? And and, and what is your your you know uh, evaluation of the effectiveness of this and participation? by students. Okay. Our program is, our Thrive lost the, the first two weeks and it continues up until the end of the second term. And we finalize or close at the end of the first semester. Up the end of, we finish at the end of the first semester by this continuous support up until the end of the year. So we, we have a, a an informal year-long orientation. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you for that. Uh, colleagues, anybody like to raise a hand or make a comment? There we go. Uh, Marilla? There's a question in the, in the chat or a comment in the chat. What is included in your DigiReady program? Is it 
broader digital literacies or just in, an introduction to the different university platforms? Thanks, Nicola. It's uh, digital literacies and also into an, an introduction on the university platforms. So it's your basic computer skills. So um, email, setting up your emails, um, using your different uh, uh, programs or uh, Microsoft programs. And what we've done now is we actually have a DigiReady course, which the which anyone can join as of our prospective students where they complete little tasks in, in assignments on Word, Excel, um, and then they get a little certificate of completion where the DigiReady uh, support buddies of our ICT students, uh, computer students, which assist with troubleshooting. So uh, we have a manned desk um, where they also assist students setting up the VPN, setting up the email addresses, setting up um, basic uh, programs on their laptop, or assisting with that. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, colleagues, I think we're gonna move on. Uh, thank you very much, Duncan. I see you're very close to your work. You've got a lovely poster behind you. Uh, we've noticed that. Uh, the first year orientation, well done. Uh, and before you go, I should say that we have something in common, uh, Nelson Mandela Bay and, and KZN, we, we also running out of water. We are on water rationing, unfortunately, and good luck with your water needs. Thank you very much. Uh, we're Thanks, now moving Eric. on to the next presentation, uh, and that is uh, evaluating how the structural design of an institution responds to the student voice. Uh, Himelo Nyani, I think, will be presenting with colleagues. Can I ask you to please stick to 20 minutes uh, for the presentation so we'll stick to our program schedule? So over to you and colleagues, please post your questions and comments on the chat. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much um, 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 for, for your patience. And let me welcome everyone who's here and was part of the presentation. Uh, my name is Flumelo Sonjani, um, a, 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 a student in the Nelson Mandela University, a postgrad and a, a, the project coordinator of the Quintile 123 Personal Mentorship Program. Uh, I am co-authoring, I've co-authored with Ronel Plagis and Francisco de Vega, who have assisted me a lot with the implementation of the project and um, have uh, also assisted me within my thought process. Um, I've I've made a little amendments to the to the to the topic as I was writing, um, um, and I've wrote, uh, it is now uh, evaluating how a student, sorry, how a system of an institution responds to new aspirations. At the Siapumelela Conference of 2021, I presented a paper that spoke on of the uh, on the advancement of the quintile one to three student support interventions to reduce the dropout rate and students getting lost within the system um, and taking more time to graduate. The paper proposed a model that could be used to deepen student support interventions, to appeal more to the quintile one to three student and be better effective. The project was born out of my own experience as a student. Sia Pumelela and the Nelson Mandela University Management came along with me and gave me a student voice, which translated into an equitable participation within the institution and how I bring the voice into existence. The idea was to offer a personalized uh, student experience that would holistically connect students to the support they need to reach for their educational and career goals. That is the quintile one to three personal mentorship project where a senior student from the lower quantiles would adopt a first year student 
and mentor them so that they walk with them as first year students. The idea was supported by the top management of the university and we were given a task to implement it as a pilot project under the learning development cluster. The project is currently in its second phase of its rollout. And, and, and during the implementation process, there are some structural and systematic factors within the institution that might be alienating the idea to be fully implement to be fully implemented. Even though there's resources available and willingness from all corners of the institution, but the idea still finds itself lost within the system. The project was rolled out last year as a pilot project in the humanities faculty. In the last teaching cycle of the 2021 academic year, using 20 mentors and 20 first year students. Most of the first year mentees reported to have seen quite a huge improvement in their psychological well being and academics after they had a mentor on their side. They now had a person who was there to channel them towards the various student support that is available for them, motivate them every time they needed the motivation and navigate the university life with. Before I had a mentor, I was struggling academically because no one was helping me or motivating me. I had no one to talk to, always stressed about my work. I was not coping well mentally, but having a mentor help, helped me so much. My mentor gave me advice on how to cope academically, emotionally and mentally. Having a mentor made my second semester slightly easier. Th that is a quote from one of the mentees as they reflect, from one of the mentees who, are, who is a first year student, uh, as they reflect on how the uh, a personal mentorship program assisted them. Um, um, the, the latter quote from Nombumelelo captures most of the mentees who hold a strong view that the personal mentorship project played a huge role in channeling them to the right path against their challenges. After a mentor detected the needs of the mentee, they would automatically reach for the consent intervention to aid their, men their mentees. For an instance, one of the mentees, Sbabala Makode, reported to have voluntarily found her mentee a, a tutor for his anthropology course. While Sisonge Mutebel and Asipopongo volunteered to personally assist their mentees with uh, computer literacy after seeing their, that their mentees were struggling with it. There are also other cases where the personal mentors had to play an advocative role in addressing some more personalized issues. Some of the personal mentors had to assist their mentees with giving them guidance on how to use university resources, such as library services. Some had to uh, advise their mentees on various things like reaching out to the student governance health services and some strategic offices within the institution. So the mentors were, were, were effective, were effective uh, in quickly responding to student challenges um, through, to, through referring them to the relevant student support. Now, how do we build a project into the system uh, as a point of scaling up. From having a storyline to having an idea as a student voice and Sia Pumelela availing an opportunity for the implementation of that idea. In the implementation, we find ourselves having some structural and systematic questions that arise in how we try to embed the project into the institutional culture. As the project reaches its second phase, we start thinking of sustainability in how we infuse the project into the institution. Now, the question of sustainability and the creation of an institutional culture 
led me to the question, question of systems. How do system, systems respond to new aspirations? Now, I, 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 I draw from the work of Donella Meadows, who is a system expert that gives us a view of how we think of systems and how a, <coughs> sorry, and how a system organizes itself. Now, this picture below gives a summary of how Donella Meadows thinks around systems. Uh, Donella Meadows sees a system as the dance in how a, a system, uh, um, uh, he sees a system as getting the beat, uh, 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 locating responsibility, expanding your thought through thought horizons, uh, 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 holding the goal of goodness celebrating com co complexity. So, so Donella Meadow gives us a view in how we think of systems in the culture of the higher education. Now, it is important that we evaluate how university systems are organized in relation to accommodation, to, to accommodation of new ideas that will tap into institutional culture. Now, Donella Meadows defines system as a set of interconnected parts that are organized as members of a mechanism that seeks to achieve a particular goal. Now, like any other organization, universities are organized as a system. Now, how, how, how do systems uh, uh, respond to new aspiration? Uh, uh, they, they, they compromise of the compromise of fixed parts such as principles, procedures, practices, structures, administrative policies, and etc., uh, which is a system. Now, Deanna J. Grayson in 2020 suggested that universities has, have systems that compromises of fixed elements to ensure effective bureaucracy and therefore concludes that efficient bureaucracies have an element of rigidity in how they allow for advanced high-minded aspirations. Efficient bureaucracies have an element of systematically alienating anything that is outside of the ideal bureaucracy. Therefore, in trying to implement an idea that is still outside of, of the ideal bureaucracy, the idea might get lost within the bureaucratic system in how a particular structure communicates with, with, with one another. With, with, sorry, with another, yeah. It is important to evaluate whether our systems do reflect the goals and visions of the institution and whether do they allow for new ideas that are foreign to the system. In view of the fact that there's an idea which is in line with the university's vision, but still finds a difficulty in maneuvering within the system in getting into the institutional culture. Now, the, the, the idea of the project is based on quintile one to three student challenges, which is a centralized phenomenon. In implementing this centralized idea trying to embed it within the systems and institutional culture, I found decentralization uh, being a question of concern, where you, where you will find parts of the system having autonomy in how they decide to support their students, and each part using its autonomy in pulling in its own direction without having a sense of communication within the system. This then creates a difficulty to a centralized idea like this, which is not specific to a, a certain part within the system to be implemented because each part would be empowered through autonomy to decide of whether to accept or reject student, the, the student support intervention. Now, this, the now, the experience of trying to implement this idea in, into ins institutional culture exposed me to a system that contains gaps. Now, in my opinion, 
the idea of centralized decentralized model is ideal because it means that a student can be passed on from a from a centralized to a decentralized model for an instance from a centralized support like support which is offered by admissions to a decentralized support which is offered by a faculty or a resident now dr timothy timothy renick of the georgia university in his presentation on this conference tuesday uh, evening said that what has made support interventions in the georgia university to be effective is how their support intervention speaks to one another and how they communicate within the system. Meaning the extent of centralization of decentral or, or decentralization within the system should not necessarily be a factor. However, systems needs to speak to each other so that all the gaps that exist can be closed. Therefore, systems need to evolve and reposition themselves to accommodate new ideas. Systems cannot wait for a merger or redesign, but should speak and look at itself so that it repositions itself in, in the way it monitors and, 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 and evaluates itself against its vision, mission, and principles. Now, having that in mind, how do we let the vision speak to the system? If the Nelson Mandela University has adopted a vision that puts the human as the center of it all, a people-centered university, a, a, a vision that speaks of Ubuntu as a value, um, and, and that brings this element of core outcome in how we think of uh, 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 how we think together to achieve how we work together to achieve a, a, a one core purpose in this idea that we will co-create towards a sustainable and socially just world and therefore how do we then let this vision speak to the practice how do we let this vision speak to the gaps within the system? And also how do we let this vision open up the system uh, uh, having, uh, uh, open up the system having such an idea or project embedded in the institutional culture and practice? Um, 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 to, in Tuesday's presentation by Chris Gibbo, uh, uh, um, he, she mentioned that for for every practice, there must be a theoretical framework. And so we, we, we already have that theoretical framework and model in, the, in how we've structured as the Nelson Mandela University, our vision and, and mission. Hello, you've got four minutes to finish. Okay, now do we let that theoretical framework speak to our practice? Now a system requires everybody to speak the same language. Now, in, 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 in closing the gaps and silos within the system, how do we structure the key, uh, how do we structure the key internal stakeholders to adopt a particular attitude towards student support of a quintile one to three student? Now, our solution or answer is located in how the stakeholder engagement has been made has, has been made central in cascading vision uh, 2030. Now to summarize, the focus should be how we break the silos within the system, how we how we integrate the system should be driven by clear targets, goals, vision, and institutional cult culture and practice ensure that all our stakeholders are integrated and coordinated towards the same vision. Sorry. Ensure that our system advocates for an, an institutional culture that encourages collaboration, work on strengthening our alignment within the Nelson Mandela brand and values. Now in closing, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a picture which shows an African proverb that says that if you want to quickly, if you want to go quickly, go alone. And if you want 
to go far, go together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jamelo. That was very, very insightful, very interesting. And, and, and thanks for sharing the personal journeys and experiences of, of students. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, if you have any questions, comments, uh, please feel free to use the chat, or you may raise your hand. We do have a few minutes. Uh, Marilla, are there any responses? We've got time, so it'd be great if people would ask questions in person or make comments in person. Uh, Jamela, I may kick off while we're waiting uh, and ask, uh, please, uh, you told us this uh, initiative now is in its second phase and you uh, have a pilot project in humanities. Uh, my question is, was there anything before this, uh, there would have been some some form of mentoring uh, for students. Uh, I just wanted to get clarity whether there was something in place before this pilot project in humanities. Um, the, um, the project um, um, came about as an idea. And now in implementing that, we, we, we had to uh, train the mentors um, it started last year, actually, in the second in the second uh, um, um, academic in the second semester of the academic calendar of 2021. So now, in the sec in the first phase, we trained and 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 mentoring was then also assisted by uh, the learning de uh, the learning uh, uh, development and and teaching. Yeah. You know? If you can please stop sharing your screen, if you don't mind. Are there any other comments? Uh... Question Hello. from, yes, uh, Jenny has a hand up. Jenny, over to you. Hi, <clears throat> thank you very much for the, the presentation. I wondered whether um, if there is a centralized student success forum or, or student success um, committee in the institution, whether this has been helpful um, to overcome the effects of decentralization. Um, because yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, 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 it's not necessarily a committee, but it's 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 um, a, a, a a department like the, the the learning and teaching um is 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 centralized to a point that um it it deals with a, a most of the of the student support, but now it gives the autonomy to a faculty in how they decide to use some of the student support and 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 so on. For instance, a a, a faculty would 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 um, a, um, choose to or not use a, 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 the SI sessions and so on. So it's it's the, the 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 decentralization is within that autonomy of using or not using it. Okay. And it's only in, in teaching and learning because there are many student success issues which are not actually related to teaching and learning, but to many mm -hmm. other things. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Any other comments? Jamila, uh, you raised an important point, you know, the actual alignment of the systems of an institution. Uh, leading towards bureaucracy and 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 what the vision and mission undertakes to do in terms of student success, I think is very very pertinent point that 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 really can often be really uh, you know mitigating against student success. Uh, you mentioned there were gaps. Uh, uh, it would sound like sometimes it would be more like barricades and impediments than gaps. Uh, are you looking further into this? How is the institution, if they accept these findings, that would be beneficial to students? Do you think there's any any uh, initiatives underway to to look at them uh, critically and introspect? There may be policies, for example, uh, that that really do not lend itself you know, to providing the kind of support for students, for example, it could be a contradiction in, in terms of what, you know, should be done. 
So my question is, do you think the institution would want to look at this and introspect? Um, in, in line with the vision of the university, I think um, the, the institution would be concerned on the type of uh, um, um, gaps and, and, and the type of uh, silos which are, are present within the system. Um, 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 because uh, because the vision would, would speak to a particular direction, but because the system is designed in such a way that uh, uh, there are those gaps now. Uh, so so it, it's a matter whether uh, uh, when do the institution when does the institution sit and say we, we do have these gaps uh, uh, probably from this presentation and 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 so on they, 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 there will be that realization that there are those gaps and I, I I'm not sure what can be done but uh, uh, try to to formulate something whether a committee or something which will look at, the, at those gaps and how we connect uh, those gaps but based on the vision of the institution uh, it, it's leaning towards a position that it's, it, it supports anything that would close those gaps. Thank you. I think we have a question, uh, Marilla. There's a, there's a question from Gina Franzman. G Gina, we've got the time. Would you not like to ask it in person? Be nice to see you. Hello, everyone. Good <laughs> morning uh, from Trebecha. Hi, Clomelo. Um, thanks for your presentation. So my question, um, for, I, I started it out with a comment because you know at our, at our university that a lot of the schools, the faculties have decided that instead of going to the LT co-lab maybe for support or for help, they would create a post or create a project in-house, so to speak, right? So you suddenly get a writing facilitator in, in a faculty that's not connected to academic literacy writing program. Are you, are you making efforts to, to sort of engage with them and to see like how that can strengthen your project? Yes, yes, that's, that's, where, that's where the project wants to focus um, 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 in, in, in trying to, to connect that system and how uh, if a faculty chooses to, to not use the, the learning development cluster, uh, uh, the, learning, the learning and teaching cluster and and try to have that program on its own. And, and we try to understand those support which are available in a, hence I say, uh, uh, the, the, there's no really a problem with this centra, uh, centralized and decentralized model, but the issue would be not understanding uh, uh, and having that connection that speaks to each other. So what is happening in the learning uh, uh, development should uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, um, speak to what is happening within a faculty. You can't have a dualization of student support because it would say that we're not moving towards the same direction and because the learning development will move towards a, a particular direction and then the faculty in how they offer the same support would move to a particular, a different direction. So um, and, and the project now would look in how we, 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 we combine those and make those two uh, uh, to speak to each other. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Melo. Uh, colleagues, is there any other comments uh, before we move on? Melo, uh, you said you're a student. Uh, are you a current student or you're a graduate? Yes, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an honor student in the Nelson Mandela. Okay, okay. Well done. Uh, good, to, good to hear your student voice at this forum. Thank you very much. Uh, Say, colleagues? Sorry. Yes, Melo. Sorry, I'd like to just congratulate you, Lomelo. I listened to you or participated in your presentation last year, and it's great to see the maturity and reflection in this one. Thank you so much. Thank well done. So there you go. All the accolades. Enjoy that. Well done. To you and, and your and your and your co-authors as well. Thank you very much. Eh? Thank uh, you. Okay. So Thank you. Uh, Okay, we're moving on uh, to the third presentation, and that is uh, Intech Data Insights into the Student Journey. This is from Dave Jenkins, Caroline Davies, and Andrea Watson, also at Nelson Mandela University. Over to you. I think it's Dave you're presenting. Right, yeah, thank you. Good morning. I have my camera on, and I see the camera has now disappeared, so my apologies for that. I'll, I'll just speak in. Um, uh, just to say, uh, Shomera, Shomera, thank you very much for that. I think also that opens for us some of the perhaps blind spots we have, um, but I think also some of what I'm going to share now 
uh, ties up with what uh, Shlumela is, is, is pointing out as a, as a critical area for support. So um, it's good to have you all join us. And um, uh, really, are we going to share something of a, of a story that we've shared already twice at, at, at previous conferences? Um, this journey started in about 2017 when we looked at revamping our um, admissions criteria and um, has been ongoing. So the revamping process started in about 2017, but we implemented in 2020 uh, with a complete new way of, of doing our admissions processes. And really what I'm reflecting on is what has happened in 2020 and 2021. Um, and I think the key, the key thing in 2020 was that we developed a whole set of new, uh, what we called applicant scores uh, based on the percentages that particulars get. And we also had two separate scores, one for students who were, for applicants who were coming with mathematics at school, and another set of scores for applicants coming in with math literacy. And I'm not going to report on that, but we have also adapted that for the technical maths programs, but the, those numbers are small and we kind of still need to refine that completely. Okay, the other thing is that the research that we're looking at has been based uh, purely on any applicant with any C result, not with other results. So in whatever schools they wrote, the NEC results both before 2020 and the ones we're looking at now. And during that initial research before 2020, what was interesting is that we started to pick up some markers from the metric results that suggested that these are perhaps um, students we should be kind of just flagging and, and, and giving additional support, the kind of support that Shlomela was talking about, come some mentoring, some um, developmental support, some encouragement to make sure they, they go on. So um, that was the one area that came up. The other area that came up was that the number of credits that students seem to be earning in their first year seemed to predict who might or might not graduate. And maybe there was some work that needed to be, due to, to be done with students who perhaps didn't get that. So what the paper gives at this stage is just feedback on the two intakes and what we're learning about the flags and what we're learning about the credits earned. Just to say that uh, we have the two intakes, the 2020 and the 2021. And this is what the sample looks like. There were 3,740 in 2020 who, were, who, who, who fell into the sample and about 3,819 in 2021. And uh, just to give you some idea of the quintiles, you'll see our, our quintile one to three component of our students is approaching 60%. Um, the age range is of our student, the vast majority being between 18 and 22. The gender profile, uh, again, slightly more for females than males, and of course we are a comprehensive university, so we have three different kinds of programs, the degrees, the diplomas, and the higher certificates, and the degrees making up just over 50% of our programs. Um, so just in terms of, of reporting back on the flags um, and, and what those are all about, um, so we had these identified flags that we'd identified in, 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 in before 2020, and these were the flags that we'd looked at. Um, in terms of reporting back, uh, there are too many flags to report on now. Some of those flags only deal with small numbers of students, and some are very specific to certain programs and certain uh, faculties, so we'll, we won't be reporting back on those. We'll re be reporting back using three of the flags, uh, because these are applicable across all faculties. Um, and um, are ones that we found to be fairly useful uh, in, in that general sense, although perhaps the age group one is quite small, the other two are fairly large. So, so that's where we are. Um, the other thing, of course, just to bear in mind, and we're not sure how this influences what is on the go, is that our initial research was, was done before 2020 when uh, the learning and teaching process was all face to face. And of course, the 20 and 21, 21 cohorts are all, all at online learning. Um, so uh, that may or may not influence things. We're not sure. Uh, only time will tell as we get a bigger cohort of students to look at. Um, but we are kind of conscious of that. All right, so um, what about the flag students? What you'll see is that uh, of those three flags that we're speaking about, uh, we were flagging the quintile one to three learners, and this ties up with what Shlomela was saying about the one to three, the quintile one to three learners needing that support as they come into the system. Um, almost 60% of our, our, our student, our first year intake, the students with math literacy, uh, around about a third of us our, of, our, of our students in the sample had math literacy at school, and then the age group, uh, those below 18 and those over the age of 23, 23 were the, the three areas we looked at. Um, 
what did we do uh, in terms of what we did? We looked at the number of credits obtained at the end of the first year. And based on that work we'd done previously, we did broke them up into three groups. Um, those who are below 80 credits, those scoring between 80 and 99 credits, and then those scoring 100 to 119 credits, and then plus 120 credits. Uh, in much of the reporting, we have combined the group 100 plus credits uh, for two reasons. One is that obviously we would expect that most programs would have 100 credits, in the, 120 credits in their first year. But we have discovered there are a few programs that uh, have slightly less than 120, so you could have a full um, complement of credits with perhaps 114 or 115. Um, and in, there are other reasons you, you'll see as, as we go along why we've, we've combined that as, in, in one. So what have we done? We've run some, some descriptive statistics using frequency tables uh, with the flags and the credits. And then just for the purpose of this presentation, um, we, the results are, are often presented per qualification, that's degree, diploma, or higher certificates. And then notice also quite importantly, uh, whether qualifications had a maths only requirement, for instance, a BSc doesn't take any math literacy students, it only takes math students as do some of your health sciences, your engineering programs, and your, some of your accounting programs. Whereas other programs will take students with both maths and math literacy, they accept both of those. So that's a different kind of program, if you like. So we've looked at the results with that split. And then occasionally we've reported the information in a, in a global way as well, just to give you some indication of what's going on there. So before we get into some too much of the detail, again, just to give you some indication, the two intakes, the 2020 and the 2021, and looking at those, um, those groupings of credits for the degree, the diploma and the higher certificate programs, and uh, what you will see with the degree programs, if you take this grouping of 100 plus credits, approximately 70% of the degree program students got 100 plus credits at the end of the, their first year. For the diploma programs, it was about 68%, so not too different. Uh, for the higher certificate, we've got a bit of a mixed bag here between uh, 2020 and 21, and, and that'll need some further monitoring and kind of just seeing what's going on. And in all the things we've done, we've noticed that the higher certificate sometimes uh, is, is not consistent over the two years, but obviously we're going to need to see something over a much longer period. Probably five years would be ideal to get a, a picture of what's going on. But our real area of concern are the students who fall into this category, but the below 80 credits, and you will see that almost a quarter of our students are falling into that category in the degree and diploma um, programs in particular, uh, certainly 2021 in the higher certificate as well, but not so much in 2020. Uh, and, and that's a, a group of, that concerns us quite a bit, and I'll explain in a moment why, why that is. You'll see that as, as we develop the, the process here. Um, so just looking at the flags uh, for the two intakes, 2020, 21, and reflecting on some those students who had no flags due to those who perhaps had as many as four flags, this obviously incorporates all those flags that you saw on the first slide of the flags. Uh, the interesting picture here is obviously that as the student number of flags increases, the, the, the number of students scoring the high number of credits actually decreases, and that's consistent across both of, of those. Um, what you'll see here is that the no flag group, uh, approximately 80% of them uh, have 100 and more credits at the end of the first year, whereas in the four flag group over here, um, only about 60% end up in that group. So there's definitely that decline. Uh, and um, we know that all the students who've come in have the potential to graduate. Uh, that was one of the criteria of, of, of the new admissions uh, process. So that's important. So uh, it's, you know, that is, is, is what the flags are telling us. And so we know that if we can make contact with these students early, we're able to provide them the kind of support and, and the kind of project that Flamella was speaking about is one of those ways of doing that, getting some of those students and, and giving them the support that they need. One of the difficulties we do face, and I think Duncan mentioned in his presentation, is many of these things are, are voluntary. Students are not compelled to attend or to participate in, in the support programs we have. And that may be something that we need to review. You don't want to make things compulsion, but maybe we need to have a, a stronger degree of compulsion uh, to getting people to be involved in, in uh, what would be developmental and encouragement kind of activities and activities that, that help them to plan better to, to reach their dreams. Um, and, and we've heard during the conference how, how many first years have chosen perhaps wrong programs or have wrong modules in their combinations. It's those kind of things 
that that often the flag students end up having in in, in, their, in their, their their program and so it's important that we get hold of them early um, so when we look at the flag specifically uh, if we look at the the age flag um, an interesting picture begins to emerge in the kind of what we might call the normal cohort the 18 to 22 year old group um, about 70 percent of those students earn 100 plus credits in their first year um, in the less than 18 age group, about 65% of that group earn 104 credits. And in the greater than 23 year age group, about 60% of them earn greater than 100 credits in their first year. And of concern in this group in particular is the high number who score less than 80 credit credits, because we do know from, from this information that, that these are students who are going to battle to graduate in particular. Um, and so, so that's a concern because either, these are students who are older, who perhaps made more of a sacrifice to come and study, and very quickly they, they, they're kind of getting into a position which is making their studies difficult, and they, they would need uh, some support to get, to get through. Um, I'm not going to spend much time, but just the same picture emerges across our degrees, our diplomas, and our higher certificates. You'll see that there for the, um, uh, the, the 2021 intake. When it comes to school quintile, um, what is the picture that's emerging? Again, if we look at the number of credits uh, that are earned here in quintile one to three, the, the plus 100 credits there, um, about 65% of the students are earning the plus 100 credits. Uh, we over here in the quintile four and five and other, others, just those schools, perhaps private schools who still who are, are writing the NEC, not uh, uh, qualification or um, school leaving certificate. That's about 75% of the, of the students getting the 100 plus credits. And then, of course, the other concern is that in the quintile one to three grouping, there's a high percentage of students who are at the 80 credit, almost a quarter of the students, one in four, are sitting at 80 or less credits. And obviously, that means already at the beginning of their first year, they're on the back foot. And we know that many of those, in fact, probably all of those students are NISFAS students, and they only have N plus one years in which they're going to receive their funding. So we need to give them the support to make sure they can compete in the N plus one years, at least uh, that number slightly less here for the quintile four and five uh, learners. Again, looking at that um, across the, the different qualifications, a very similar pattern emerges. Uh, and again, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go, go into that in too much detail. And then when we get to the maths and math literacy, uh, kind of results, uh, again, uh, a similar pattern is evolving there, um, but perhaps the gap is not as big as we might have expected. So here in the students who came in with maths uh, into the system, about 70% of them would have 100 plus credits, as opposed to the math literacy students where about 65% have 100 plus credits, um, and at the less than 80 uh, credits, the, the gap Again, slightly higher for those math, math literacy and slightly lower for those who've done maths. And so a concern there that, that we're addressing, or, or are we addressing and are we supporting those students to help them find their feet uh, to be successful in, the, in their studies? Um, and then the last of the slides really on the flags, um, just reinforcing that there, uh, that same pattern uh, for the maths and math literacy, seeing the differences for the degrees, the diploma, and the higher certificate um, that occurs right across the board. And so, so what the flags are doing for us, they're really helping us to um, say right at the beginning uh, of the, the student journey, there are certain students who need to be uh, given more encouragement, perhaps more developmental support, uh, and to be helped along their way to find their feet, because if we can help them find their feet and, 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 and end up in the 100 plus credit zone, we have a much chance, a better chance of them graduating. And that's what we'd like to, to do. Uh, the challenge is how do we reach them all? I think the question was asked to Shlomela, how, how, how well coordinators are our activities. And there's perhaps a much bigger need for us to coordinate better between faculty and between our support programs. Uh, and we need to be taking that up in the future, but I'll comment on that towards the end uh, just now. Okay, and then uh, just looking at academic performance, uh, here what we've done is we've taken uh, those who registered in 2020 and then registered again in 2021 and then registered again in 2022, and we've tracked them to see how they're doing. Um, so what we've got then are the same groupings. They start in 2020, they had less than 80 credits, 
or they were in the group that had 80 to 99, et cetera, going across at exactly the same groupings in 2022. So the students were in those groups. Um, the dark blue line are the students who registered for the same program as they started with in 2020. The light blue lines are the students who changed programs either within their faculty or changed faculties. And the orange color is the students who kind of uh, dropped out of the system, did not register again. And in the less than 80 credits, that obviously is, is a bit of a concern. If you look at that uh, in, in 2021, in other words, what would have been their second year, 26% of the students did not register again. That's 26 in 100 students. So if you took 20, 26 from 100, you end up with 74 students. Then that same group, 32% uh, don't return in 2022. Uh, that's the further 24 students. In fact, you end up with about 50 students out of 100 not returning. Those are students who had dreams of achieving something in higher education, who've kind of been lost to the system, who've been disillusioned. And if you look at, if you take that the figure I showed earlier of about a quarter of our intake being students who, who fall into this less than 80 credits, uh, credits and we have about 6,000 first years coming in, that could be as many as 750 students dropping out uh, of the system, uh, maybe coming back, but maybe never coming back again and, and being disillusioned. And what, what are we doing to catch those students, to help those students is really the question. Uh, and how do we retain them uh, there? The other interesting group that we don't have any feedback for you yet, but we're hoping to do that is this group here, the light blue group who change programs to see what happens to them. It doesn't help them to change programs. Do they become more successful by changing programs? And that's something that we will be looking at as we go forward. Um, Okay, just uh, looking at the, at, the, at the 2020 intake, uh, where we just looked at how they registered from 2020 to 2021. Uh, and again, a similar pattern, we've broken that up into degrees and diplomas, so we could see that. We have that information for the 2020 intake as well. Um, but that just allows you to see, see what's happening, that, that the, the pattern is the same, the numbers are a little bit different, but, but really a very similar pattern. Um, and there it is for the 20, sorry, that was the 2020 intake, and that's the 2021 intake. Um, but again, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on that. Um, so, but from that, you can see our concern really is the students who have a, a less than 80 credit, uh, fall into that less than 80 credit bracket in the sense that, that what's happening to those students. Um, the other question we asked ourselves is if, if the student ends up in a certain kind of grouping, do they move out of that group? So we again tracked that 2020 group and had a look at what happened to them at the end of 2021. Obviously, we've only got the results for 20, end of 2020 and the end of 2021. We'll only have the 2022 results later in the year. So those students and uh, who are in, uh, well, let me just go back a, a fraction, just look at the top here. So we've got the two kinds of programs, the maths, math literacy programs, and then the programs with maths only. Um, and and the, there's quite a, a, an interesting picture that, that's quite different between those two groups. So if you look at the grouping of got maths, math literacy, those who fall into the 100 credit grouping, the vast majority stay in that 100 plus credits. In other words, they earn another 100 credits in their second year. And they're on track then to graduate in minimum time or minimum plus one at least. Um, so they're, they're in a fairly good position they're funded, they're going to keep their funding, and they're going to be successful. Those who fall into the 80 to 99 credits, just under 50% of them improve, 50%, just under 50% of them improve their situation and move perhaps up into this area. So they're, they're getting back on track, but the concern is this bigger group who are dropping down and are falling into that less than 80 credit group and therefore are going to have some difficulty. They're going to lose funding. They're going to become disillusioned. And our other concern is right here at the bottom that so many, almost, almost three quarters, well, almost 70% of those with less than 80 credit don't move out into a higher bracket. In other words, they're not improving. Um, and and, and, and you know, what are we doing about getting them there? When we go to the maths grouping, we have a slightly different picture and quite a concerning picture. And, and yesterday there was some talk about the need for second year orientation. And perhaps this is where the whole area of second year orientation becomes very, very important because look at what's happening with our maths only programs. So this would be your BSCs, your engineers, uh, those kind of programs. 70% of them in the 100 plus credits stay there. Almost a third are having their marks go down to a lower, a lower category. When we come to the 80 to 99 credit area, 
Look what's happening there. Almost three quarters of them, their marks have dropped. They are now falling into a position where it's becoming more and more difficult to graduate, and very few of them are moving out of into a better or stronger academic position. And again, down here at the bottom, uh, a very high percentage of students who are staying where they were, they're not moving, they're not improving. What's happening, and and and, and what are we going to do uh, about about that? So um, that that is a concern that. That, that, that these, these numbers are showing us and, and, and kind of directing us as to where we need to be putting our efforts. Um, yeah, just looking at, and I'm not going to spend too much time because I think my time is going to be running out in a moment. Uh, David, we've got three minutes. Okay. Uh, there's just looking at the same information for the 2020 intake um, and a similar picture. Uh, and this is looking at it for the quintiles. Again, the picture is similar. What is interesting with the quintiles though, is you'll see, and this was something that was reflected in our earlier research where we saw that the quintile one to threes graduated at a similar rate to the quintile fours and fives. And in their second year, what's happening is that a, a higher percentage of the quintile one to three learners or students are moving out of this 80 to 99 credit area than the quintile four and five learners. And the other thing, is that a higher percentage of the quintile four and five learners are moving downwards than the number in the, in the quintile one to three. So there seems to be a balancing up as the quintile one to three learner uh, finds their feet in the system. And again, what Slomero was talking about, this is why that's so important to do that. And a similar picture reflected here at the bottom. Uh, if I had more time, we could spend more time on that one. And uh, again, the quintiles with the maths only program, but again, I'm not going to spend too much time here, other than to say the picture is very bleak for the maths only programs. And obviously, quite a lot of intervention is going to be needed there with our maths only programs. Um, we did the same with the diploma students, and a very similar picture came out there. I'm not going to go into the diploma student picture. If you want those, I can show you those slides outside of the meet, outside of the session. I want to end with this slide. Um, we then also did a, a look at the kind of cumulative credits that the students would have gathered over the, the, the two years of study so far. And again, we've looked at that grouping, the less than 80 credits, the 80 to 99 credits, and those are scored more than 100 credits. And here we've changed the grouping slightly. We've looked at those who ended up with less than 120 credits, those with 120 to 179 credits, and then we've got two groupings, 180 to 239 credits. Those are students who probably could graduate in N plus one years, and obviously a student at the end of the second year with 240 credits is on track to graduate in minimum time. So it's just interesting to see what happens here because um, in the less than 80 credits grouping, a very high percentage of those students haven't even doubled their credits. They've actually ended up, in, and this is in both quintile one and quintile two, have ended up with, with, with sorry, we've ended up with about 65, 66% of our students with less than 120 credits. Um, and they will need some serious intervention and some seri serious remedial work to get them out of that position. But there are also a fairly high number of students in this 120 to 179 grouping. And if they're at the bottom end of that, they're also going to be in some, some difficulty. When we get to the 80 to, 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 to 99 credit grouping, um, the picture changes a little bit. Uh, here we see that uh, a fair number of them have moved into the 180 239 credit grouping, so they stand a reasonable chance of graduating in N plus one years, but they still are pretty close to, I think it's 50%, who are in this lower credit area of concern. And so we also need some very serious, probably remedial support to help them uh, to, to get there. Um, and then obviously with the 100 plus credits, what we're seeing is, is quite an interesting pattern. We're seeing a, a, a good number of them being able to graduate uh, in, 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 in minimum time. But if you add these two numbers together, the, the, the dark blue and the, and the green columns, what you'll find is about 90% of those students are on track to graduate in at least N plus one. And so what we're finding there is that our quintile one to, to three students seem to be kind of catching up at that point in time and, 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 and kind of getting to where we want them. So uh, that's the picture that's emerging. Um, and that we obviously now need to go and share with faculty. We need to go and share with all our support uh, service people. And we need to start looking at how we better coordinate what we do, how we better. Currently, we're sharing the flags with everybody, with the faculty and with all our support service people at the beginning of the, the academic year. We try and get it done by March. 
Um, but we need to automate that system so we don't have to even wait any time for that um, so that people have those markers much more much earlier. Um, but we also need to have a much more coordinated way in which we identify those students and refer them to the necessary support, uh, especially perhaps group support where they can, can learn some of the skills that are important. Uh, perhaps getting those, mentor, those mentors that we spoke about with the quintile one to three learners as our quintile one to three complement grows, we need to be looking at that. Um, and then we have also started a coaching program and you might hear a little bit of that in the next presentation where we've identified the, those students with the 80 to 99 credit grouping and, and kind of worked quite intensively with them from a coaching perspective for the first time this year. Um, we've decided to go there because of limits of capacity um, and, and hoping that we get better returns there, but we still need to see what we're going to do about the less than 80 credits. So, so that's really the picture that's emerging that we need to share. Obviously, it needs further tracking to get the, the you know, we need to follow that cohort at least for five years to get a, a full picture of what's happening. Um, but that, that's what I've got to share at this point in time. Um, I'll hear if there are any questions and, and try and take those. And Caroline and Andrea will help me with, in answering those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, it was quite interesting, uh, these flags uh, and the correlation with the credits, age, quintiles. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Marilla, uh, do we have anything on the chat? There's nothing in the chat, so if anyone would like to ask a question, you're invited to do so. I think the number of slides may have frightened people away. <laughs> number of graphs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave, can I ask, uh, hmm. did you go back uh, pre-COVID to look at uh, the, the picture, you know, and, and compare it with what's going on, you know, post-COVID or during COVID? Yeah, so, so what we did was pre-COVID, we actually set up those criteria. So the, 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 the flags and the, the, the credit kind of groupings were based on the pre-COVID position. Um, what we're reflecting on is the post-COVID situation, but in fact, the picture is very, fairly similar. There are some differences. For instance, the maths, math literacy, the gap between the, the credits between the maths and the math, math literacy group has got slightly smaller. We, the question to ask is, is that because we adjusted the admissions criteria to kind of um, support that situation, because that's what we did. We have a, a difference of 15 points between a student who has maths and, and math literacy. Is that changing the, the difference in how they're performing? Or is it something else in the system? We actually don't know that. Um, and of course, while we're talking about math literacy, the other question is, what is it about math literacy that prepares a student a little less for university uh, education? Um, because it's not really about numbers. Many of those programs are not numbers programs. There, there's, there's something else there that, that needs to be looked at. And that's obviously a, a big question that, 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 that needs some further investigation um, you know, around that. But yeah, so, so to answer your question, yes, the, 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 the initial data was based on pre-COVID. The picture that's emerging is similar, but some of the differences are, are slightly perhaps smaller uh, than they had been in the pre-COVID group. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on, on going forward, the interventions, the types of support, the, the, the resources? Uh, Etc. Uh, and it's still early days, but uh, yeah. So I, I, I think the, the 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 first thing we have a lot of a lot of support available for students, but it, it is largely voluntary. And as I said, as as I was speaking, there there may be a need to. Um, I, I don't like to make things compulsory, but there may be a need of compul for some more compulsion around what we're doing. In other words, to get people to certain people to be involved in some of those activities much much earlier. Um, a little bit like what we're doing with, with that, that project that Shlomela spoke about, where they have the mentors, they identify the students who've come from Quintal 1 to 3 schools, and they actually approach those students and invite them directly. And, and maybe that's the kind of way to, to be going uh, to the students. So, so obviously the support service is available to everybody, and, and we want good students to come to some of those support activities as well. But, but those who we know need to come there perhaps need a, a stronger invite uh, with a a stronger measure of compulsion, I'm not quite sure what the right word is there, that, that, but certainly of encouragement that they, they, they're involved with that. And then more coordination, I think, between faculty. Um, we, we share those names with faculty. They know who the students are. Um, we share them with the people in the, in, the, in the support programs, but perhaps there's not sufficient communication between those two and sufficient monitoring, uh, which is something that we need to develop further. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Marilla, are there any uh, comments or questions? Or if anybody else has a comment or question? Hands? Uh, no hands that I can see. Okay. Um, all right. I think uh, on that note, thank you very much, uh, all right, Dave. Thank you. We, mm -hmm. We've got a common thread uh, at NNMU. Uh, so we're now going to have the, the presentation by Unati, uh, Silo, Terry Ann Jones, and Kim Herter. An emerging story of student success coaching at Nelson Mandela University. Over to you, uh, is it Unati? Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, my name is Kim, and I'll be starting uh, the presentation. Uh, and then, Go ahead. Uh, yes, please. Unati and Terry Ann will, will follow on from me. Um, so thanks, Unati. If you don't mind, just moving to the next. Can you see Kim? Yes, are you able, is it on slideshow, hey? Yes. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to start just with uh, this quote, the future is not the place we are going to, but the one we are creating. And the paths are not to be found, but to be made. And the activity of making them changes both the maker and the destination. And this powerful quote completely captures the journey that has unfolded at our institution as we have moved towards including student success coaching as a new support program at the university. As part of a broader institutional restructuring process that eventually saw a group of permanent staff members moved from an access assessment role to more of a student development and support role, conceptualizing, developing and implementing student success coaching has been a process of drawing the map and really building the car as we drive. Thanks, Anati. Could you go to the next slide? Can you do the presentation mode? S slideshow. Make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to just start with a um, quick overview of some of the background information, just to help contextualize the move to success coaching and, and just to position it within the university. And then my colleagues will continue by walking you through some of the key cycles in the process so far, um, hopefully providing some initial insights into how success coaching is starting to unfold and to take shape at our university. So um, at NMU, in our uh, sort of previous structure, uh, just before the, the restructuring process that has recently taken place, uh, we had grouped a range of centers which had a very strong academic related focus into a structure that was called the Higher Education Access and Development Services, or commonly known as HEADS. And this structure was made up of three centers, the Center for Access Assessment and Research, Center for Teaching, Learning and Media, and then Student Counseling and Career Development Center. Um, as a whole, HEAD served to create a responsive environment that fostered student access and success, and it has served its purpose well over the years. Um, however, in response to a changing environment and some changing needs, HEAD underwent a fit for purpose review in 2017. And I just wanted to highlight on, on this slide that, that of the three centers that form part of HEADS, um, CAR was one of those centers that was quite significantly impacted uh, um, in that restructuring process of, after the review. Thanks, Anati. So um, this review led to a reimagination process and um, ultimately to a new structure and a new way of working. 
Uh, the Fit for Purpose review that started in 2017, and it, it did take some time, uh, found, uh, had a number of findings. And the one, one was centered around just the changing student body and, and the recognition of changing needs. That really meant we had to rethink the nature of the supportive learning environment um, that, that we were fostering. In particular, students were calling for more one-on-one -on -one connections uh, as, as part of the, the support that was being offered. There was also a significant shift in the extent and severity of mental health needs um, of our student body and our counselors, the number of counselors that we had hadn't increased over the years uh, to meet to meet those needs and, and so capacity was really becoming a challenge. And then just some other findings, you know, we found that there was a need to tailor the range of peer led programs and to put them under one umbrella to try and achieve a greater impact. And we needed to start exploring predictive analytics to inform earlier student interventions and to drive the student success agenda. So these findings also then occurred in a context where there were a number of other factors that were coming to the fore or had already come to the fore. And some of those factors that were especially important and related to student success you know, included the fourth industrial revolution, um, the fees must fall movement, and then a shift, particularly at our institution, from focusing on access to, to a greater focus on success and what happens after access. And then also the emergence and, and the movement of, of bringing academic advising more and more into the higher education context, specifically within, within South African universities. So all of these then informed the creation of a new structure, um, which was called the Learning and uh, Teaching Collaborative for Success, uh, or the LT Colab. Renati, could you just move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So that focuses on an interdisciplinary collaboration that harnesses individual expertise and collaborative strengths. The LT Colab is made up of various clusters or subclusters, of which the three centers from heads were then restructured um, to become a part of. And the cluster that we, are, we really want to focus on today is the learning development cluster, which was then created with a number of subclusters. And that um, and, and coaching, student success coaching was positioned within that learning development uh, cluster. Thanks, Anati. So the LD cluster um, focuses on empowering students holistically on their learning pathways through nurturing targeted and collaborative learning experiences. Thank you. And you can see there that student coaching is positioned within that learning development cluster, um, along with a number of other support services as well. Thanks, Anati. So just to go back to those findings, one of the main findings was that the students require more one-on-one -on -one connections that would assist them to review their progress, identify challenges, and plan a way forward towards a successful academic journey. And that is really the starting point um, for, for student success, uh, the, the student success coaching program or cluster that was then incorporated as part of the LT CoLab. And staff from the, the car, from the car or from car that was originally in the head structure were repurposed and uh, we were moved to this new student success coaching cluster. And so that's just a little bit of background to position student success coaching. And I think Renati is going to take it forward from here. Okay. Thank you, Kim. And then it was upon, uh, it was upon this background then um, and context that we started to frame this new emerging story of student success coaching at Nelson Mandela University in this new chapter of our journey. We used mainly in 2019 to conceptualize what we needed to do, how we wanted to do it, and also how what the benefit would be for students if we were to operate as coaches in this space. So um, in doing so, we had to take stock in terms of what we had in our bag, mainly around human resources, the skills that we already 
previously had. Um, most of the individuals that or employees that were going to take this new role were mainly psychologists or people with psychology background. And we had already introduced the education um, people with education background and open space for um, uh, employees with social work background. We also understood that we had experience in higher education and more specifically, we're familiar with the um, um, context of um, Nelson Mandela, Mandela University and most of the staff were connected uh, with faculties and had relationships um, with the faculties from the previous role. And more specifically, we had um, existing one-on-one um, -on -one modalities that supported student success within our institution. We did, however, identify some gaps, mainly around our training and coaching. And also we had no reference in terms of an existing coaching program within the higher education context. So we wanted to identify in terms of what coaching was for the education, sorry, for in Nelson Mandela University. Okay, sorry, I just need to go to the next slide. Okay. Um, in doing so, we had a, an overview of the existing one-on-one -on -one student uh, support modalities, identifying student wellness as one of them, and um, uh, student academic, co uh, ac academic advising, mentoring, tutoring, learning development, peer advising and helping, and we were forming part of this existing um, support body. And we also wanted to identify um, where these services were, were located and their role and also the focus area, which helped us in forming or framing what coaching was going to be at Nelson Mandela University. We were cautious um, uh, many a times because we, would, we didn't want to overstep some of the boundaries, but we had to pull back at times and look back what the overall um, goal was in terms of the call for collaborative services. In defining coaching at Nelson Mandela University, um, we were starting to understand that coaching did allow for flexibility for practitioners to define um, their practice in a meaningful way and also purposeful manner. And also in the educational context, we are starting to understand that coaching was mainly used to render personalized support services. We did this by reflecting on literature that was currently existing, models and theories that were available for student support, and also consulted with various stakeholders internally, and also these existing modalities who, whom we've invited to share what they were offering to, 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 to students and also externally, and we have consulted with other institutions, both locally and also internationally, and have consulted with professionals within the education, sorry, professionals within the coaching space, and had to undergo um, a relevant training. Okay, what started to emerge for us was some of the guiding principles that we wanted to include as part of our uh, coaching program. We wanted our coaching program to mainly look at a, or maybe to have a collaborative um, impact, collaborative relationship where the coach journeyed with the student in terms of co-creating a plan for success. We also identified student centeredness as an important principle and looking at, at a student in a form of a author of their story and also identified student in terms of a whole, holistically looking mainly at students as full uh, beings. And lastly, or second last, we identified that we wanted to focus on goals, but also um, solutions towards what the student was bringing into this coaching space. We wanted to use currently existing data, mainly around first year markers, which Dave has um, indicated. 
What we came out with in this process, we then identified or defined coaching as a high impact connection, which actively engaged student, uh, students in developing a personalized success plan to, um, to collaborative learning experiences. What we wanted out of this or how we envisioned in terms of the benefits that, would, uh, that we foresee in coaching was creating self-awareness um, and social awareness with students and also support students in clarifying some of, this, um, some of their goals and also wanted to support students in, in organizing and also acquiring um, academic skills and also enhancing healthy um, academic habits. And finally, we were playing a role in terms of supporting or um, uh, um, supporting students with encouragement and promoting accountability. We also had to look in terms of how we wanted to, to do or um, to operate in terms of our, um, uh, our university system. Um, most of our coaches, we said, were going to be based in faculties, but uh, were going to be located in the LT Colab. And we had, at, at the time, identified um, the student account list uh, groupings who were referred mainly for, uh, for financial exclusion and had the, fine, um, the first year markers as a targeted groups where we wanted to invite these students for um, coaching interactions. At the time we would say um, most of the services would be face to face and we had to look into a booking system that would support us in this task and also administrative resources such as an intake form, consent form, process notes and case management and lastly the referral system. And we had to look at how student data was going to be stored. Um, some of the focus areas that we, we said we'd be looking at mainly was around a one-on-one -on -one high impact connection, um, looking at enhancing strategic academic skills for success, and also helping students in navigating academic challenges. And lastly, um, connecting students to relevant academic and support programs. What transpired in our first year of operation, um, we, uh, we had not anticipated that our numbers would have been um, this low, but we had uh, connected with some students, but what we had identified when we were doing the face-to-face, -face, um, most of the students um, were highly enriched. As you can see, 50% of our students were uh, targeted or maybe came for session in the first quarter of the year 2020. And some of the reasons for consultations, uh, we identified some themes that were emerging in consultation and the majority of our students, we assisted mainly um, with study skills, goal setting and uh, time management and motivation, um, which were the themes that came up strongly in 2020. 2020. Four minutes to go. Okay, 2021, this was a picture that was improving. And again, there were themes that came up and, uh, for both years, which were common to 2020. And some of the, our learnings at the time, um, we learned that we needed to improve uh, uh, marketing strategies. And we also um, looked at um, the impact of, of COVID, mainly around we needed to be adaptive, collaborate in terms of the university's needs and um, look at um, cross-disciplinary interactions and lastly, look at um, staff support. Terry, over to you. So at the end of 2021, we, um, we decided that there was a need for review of our processes in order for us to move in intentionally and strategically into the next phase of focus development and growth for our um, success coaching program. So when we started the program originally, we were all linked to a specific faculty. And with that, um, with the amount of students that were coming through, we weren't able to service them 
as best we could. So after the review, we moved to a centralized faculty linked coaching service. Next slide, slide please. So how is coaching practice at NMU? So we offer a, um, the service is offered voluntary service to all students. Um, we currently are eight coaches at the university. Um, one of the coaches are at the, uh, located at the George campus. So in terms of the length of the session, it depends on the needs of the student. And we allocate 45 minutes to one hour per student. Um, sessions are designed and, and very personalized depending on the needs and the goals of the student. In terms of referrals, so in, we don't want to overstep and cross boundaries in, and work outside of our scope. So when deemed necessary, we do refer students to the relevant support services. When we originally started the process, um, we were doing mask to mask um, sessions and then COVID hit and we had to change our services that we did offer and we offered an online service via Teams and Zoom and WhatsApp calls. So all sessions are confidential and they are recorded and this and process notes are completed for each session and stored appropriately. So once the review was done, we also, um, we developed a coaching model which we could ensure that all our coaches are able to structure their coaching sessions in a, in a flexibility, in a, in a manner that was flexible, but also across students as well. So in terms of the model, we used success and it was a, a way of students to share their story. And also as a coach, we were then able to understand the student situation and intention on their journey at university. And together with the students, we were able to consider all the possible ways forward, working with the student, collaborating with the student to develop a success plan, which they can complete on their own. During the process, we are able to encourage students for them to take accountability through ownership, allowing them to further take responsibility in how they execute the actions that we have discussed. Thereafter, we are able to discuss resources that are needed, support structures that are, are required for them, enable to assist them on this journey. And we would like them to step forward and to change their world by being accountable and responsible for their actions. Next slide, please. So in terms of data support, we, we, we understood and knew that we had this data available and how, and we thought about how we were able to utilize this data in order to support our coaching program. And the first um, group that we looked at were the first year markers, and they were identified based on the AS, the age, the quantile, and maths, maths lib. And once they were identified, coaches invited these students to attend a coaching session. We then, for this year, we looked at the senior credits flags in terms of first year students that are starting in their second year, but who had completed 80 to 99 nine credits in the previous year. Next slide. And in terms of case management, we require a, a, a database in order to capture our information. So we developed, originally we developed a case management file and as it progressed, we re-looked at it and refurbished it to, to meet the needs that we now required in terms of what we wanted, in terms of reporting as well. So we look across five broad focus areas when we are coaching. We can just move on. And then our learnings, um, we understood that we required a unified but flexible approach to the way we engage with students during our coaching sessions. We were then able to gain a greater understanding with regards to the training and supervision needs of our coaches and the greater consideration of staff wellness. As well as with the vast amount of data that was accessible to us at our institution, we were able to further understand how we could use this data at our institution as well. Next slide. In conclusion, with a tremendous amount of planning, reflecting and adapting, has allowed for, our, for possibilities to emerge as our student success coaching story that we are able to share today and with others. The interconnectedness of student support services remain an integral part of the emerging story of student success coaching. And just as we believe that each of our students have a unique story to tell as so does the student success unit. 
We are able to draw from our challenges, our successes, as we enter into the next chapter of our story of student success coaching at the Nelson Mandela University. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that presentation. Uh, let's see if we have any questions, Marilla. Questions in the chat? Then, oh, great. Gina has his hand up. Please feel free to ask your question or comment. Uh, Gina? Thought you had your hand up, Gina. No? Uh, we can't hear you, Marilla. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Don't know why. Let me put on my okay, we can headphones. Hear you now. We can hear you. Now can fine. you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Now. I thought Gino had his hand up. No? Yeah. I actually don't. <laughs> You've got the floor now, Gino. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, can I ask... Uh, there was a restructuring. Uh, I'm not sure when, when that occurred. Uh, and, and what are the other programs that support students' uh, success that, that are current at, at uh, NMU? Um, so the, within the uh, learning development co uh, cluster uh, within the LT CoLab, um, the other kinds of programs would, would be um, the mentoring. Much of the mentoring um, is, is peer mentoring or, or peer led. Um, we have SI, which is also a part of the learning development cluster. So we use our student uh, SI facilitators for that. Um, academic advising uh, is also starting to, to emerge at the institution. Um, we have faculty-based uh, or staff academic advisors um, in, in, or a staff academic advisor in, in the faculty of, of science. Uh, but we are starting to hear uh, use peer um, collaborative learning in terms of faculty, faculty academic advising as well. So, um, <clears throat> So there's that aspect that is uh, starting to just grow a little bit more within our institution. Um, we do have our tutors then. Uh, those Many of those tutors are also peer-led. So a lot of um, collab peer collaborative kind of support initiatives. Um, and then uh, Mton Jenny, which is our student previous student counseling center, um, they also offer um, you know one-on-one -on -one kind of services as well. Okay, thank you for that, Tim. Dave, Dave, you're on the floor. Okay, Dave. just to say that Kim has, has outlined those, but obviously within that also is the first to success program and also writing support. So it also falls into that, that cluster. So it's quite a range of services that, that work in, in that. Um, in that. I see Judo's put them in the, in, the, in the chat as well. So the idea is to coordinate those together. One of the challenges has been obviously is that, that the restructuring was implemented in 2020, at the beginning of 2020, and we hardly got started. And, and obviously, um, um, the, the COVID situation has not really helped us to, to, to implement it in, in terms of, of coordinating it as well as we'd like to have coordinated that restructuring. But it's there and it's working, but there's, I think, lots of work still to be done. And hopefully, as we go more face to face now, we can be able to do a lot more uh, of that staff interaction. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh any other comments? Liesl, Liesl Smith? Would you, like, would you like to just share your comment in person, Liesl? It'd be lovely to see you. Hi, Marilla. Um, sorry, I, I'm not going to switch on my camera. I'm losing connection every now and again. We're just coming out of load shedding. Um, it's just... For, for us in the other support programs, um, this has really been a fantastic resource to have our success coaching colleagues. Um, and 
you, sometimes you don't realize how big the need is until that program is there and then you can't imagine how you did without it because there has been more than one situation where I needed information for SI and the information was just not forthcoming from a faculty where I could quickly go to one to the success coach that works in that colleague and uh, who works in that faculty and say um you know, do you perhaps know why this is happening? Or do you perhaps, have you heard why they're doing it like this? And that information is invaluable when you can start talking across support programs about what's happening in the faculties. And sometimes things are happening that are just beyond our scope. It's beyond our scope of expertise and beyond the scope of what we're capable of addressing in our support programs. And then it's wonderful to know that we have the success coaching colleagues that we can refer students to for additional support. Um, that maybe the SI leaders just don't have the time and capacity or sometimes even the expertise to address. And then it's wonderful to know that we can support students. Oh, thank you for that comment, uh, Diesel. I think they would appreciate that. Uh, are they, can I ask quickly, uh, what, what would be the, the requirements for, for staff that are involved in, in coaching the eight uh, colleagues that you mentioned, or, you know, what is the background? Okay, so perhaps I should comment here and I'll rescue the coaches a little bit um, to say that that initially the, the because it was an organizational redesign process, staff were moved from the access testing unit to, to coaching. So they were all, they all had a psychological background. They were all registered either as, as, as registered counselors or as, as psychologists. But in terms of, of what we, we've, we've redefined that, um, people must either have a, a, a psychological or educational or a, a social work background, and they must be registered with a professional body uh, from that perspective. Uh, they must have at least a, an M plus four, so they must have at least completed uh, their, their professional kind of qualification. Uh, and then we would obviously like to have people having some coaching training. So what we've done with all the staff who are involved in the program, they've all attended uh, a coaching course. Those staff who were part of the redesign, as we appoint in future, obviously we're looking for people who've got some coaching background. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I, I must say, I found that very uh, interesting comment uh, from Kim about the heads reimagine. Uh, I think a lot of people don't see it the wrong way. But uh, I understand with the restructuring. So thank you for that. Uh, if there's no further comments or questions, uh, I want to thank you all uh, for your wonderful presentations. Thank you very much for the effort. And I think it was highly appreciated. We had a very good turnout. I think we had up to 26 uh, participants at the up, session. Up to, th up to 30. 30, OK. Uh, thank you, Mirilla. Uh, so that was uh, really an interesting session, and I want to thank you very much for, for your input, and good luck with the restructuring and your new journey. Thank you, Mirilla. I appreciate it. Uh, enjoy your lunch, and then we'll see you in the next session. Thanks, Paul, and thanks for accommodating the change in our presentation. Thank you. Thank well you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to the participants for being here and engaging. Thank you.